Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. Lord, it is good to be surrounded by your, by your children. It is good to be in your house worshiping you today. We come together, Lord, seeking your will, looking into your word, finding the truth that we might apply to our life, looking for ways, Lord, that we might walk faithfully after you. So, Lord, our prayer request today as we sing praises to your name, that your word, as it comes from our mouth, might be pleasing to the others that we talk to. In our conversation, Lord, may we build up one another. May we not use our spiritual gift of, gift of criticism to tear people down, but instead have words of faith, words of grace that build each other up. Lord, may we see the importance of hospitality as a way of showing our Christian faith with one another, with friends and co-workers, opening our arms, opening our life, that they might see what it looks like to be followers of Christ, that they might be able to say, that's what genuine Christianity looks like. Not something on a YouTube video, but a 3D version of real Christianity with all of the imperfections, but it is so much better than what everything else life has to offer. And may they see Christ in us and be drawn to him. Lord, we think of our brothers and sisters who aren't here. We ask, Lord, that you would work in their life as they are spending time in your word, molding them to Christ, guide and direct them and give them boldness as they have opportunities to share Christ with others. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you brought your Bibles with you, I'm sure. I'm going to ask you to open up to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18 is our scripture reading for today. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Lord, we just seek your guidance and your direction. Help us to understand your truth. Lord, it's not just here as a book for us to read through and mark off on the list of books that we've read for the year. It's a book that's supposed to transform us, not reform us, but completely change the way that we think, the way that we behave, and it will change us literally, physically. So we look forward to that. In Jesus' name, amen. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, why does the Apostle Paul make such a declaration about Christ to the Colossians? It seems like a simple statement, maybe a bumper sticker, but they didn't have cars back then. And this is not a chariot sticker that would go on the back of a chariot. But this statement, as you roll it around in your mind, he is the image of the invisible God. Wait a minute. That's an oxymoron. That can't be. Because if it's true, what does it mean? Well, mankind has a way of making up stories about God. Every culture has stories about God and the beginning of the universe. There were many teachers in the Hellenistic world combining religion, myth, and philosophy. And some of these ideas were very, very attractive. And they spread throughout the Roman Empire. Our society today offers the same type of attractive people and the same type of attractive ideas. And they have no better answers to the question, who is God? And how was the world created? So our society offers no better answer than the answers that were given to people in Asia Minor 
over 2,000 years ago. And yet the book of Colossians begins with this great prayer. And it's Paul's prayer that the reader of this book, you and I, would be filled with the knowledge of God's will and discernment. Christian discernment is greatly needed today. We must know God's will and be able to discern more than the difference between good and evil. We are expected to discern between what is good and what is supreme. The supremacy of Christ is the theme of the book. The object of our faith is laid out in chapters 1 and 2, and the focus of our faith is found in chapters 3 and 4. Now, I know you've been reading this book, and I'm, as I'm sure that all of you have, you've taken the time this week or last week, and you've made your way from chapters 1 through chapters 4, and you've noticed that as you've read through, there is a focus on doctrine, and then you get to the last half, it's duty. It's belief and it's behavior. It's certainty and then it's conduct. And if you haven't had a chance to read Colossians, let me encourage you. Let me exhort you. Let me plead with you or beg you. Please, read this book before next week. And I promise you this, your understanding of what I'm going to say next week will be enhanced. You will find yourself learning more from the messages if you only read through this book once during the week, even if you listen to it on audio, you will gain a lot more understanding about this book and what Christ wants you to do. Our text today reveals the, the relationship of, that Christ has with the Father. And in that relationship with the Father, we see everything that God is, the God-man has, and everything that the man of God needs, that's us, is found in the God-man. The relationship of Christ with creation, we're also going to look at. And we're reminded of what's stated in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, where it says, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Another one of those funny phrases that the Apostle Paul says, where the invisible is seen. And we just kind of scratch our head and go, if it's invisible, how do we see it? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It even reveals the relationship that Christ has with the church. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, In him you have been made complete. He is the head over all. And he rules, and he is the authority. So as we follow along our outline today, we're going to make it simple. Just simple three points. The first is Christ and the Father. The second, Christ and creation. And finally, Christ and the church. So we've got verses 15 through 18. And we've got three points. So it's easy for us to follow through and look and go, all right, this will be easy for us to work our way through and later even study and share with someone else. So our very first point deals with Christ and the Father. Again, just repeating the same thing I've already repeated twice. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. He makes the invisible visible. How is that even possible? We know from our simple Bible teaching that we've had from, as a child, or that we've gained from a general Bible study, that nobody has ever seen God. For God is a spirit being. In John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Later on, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he says, Now the Lord is spirit. So how is it that if God is invisible and He's a spirit being, how can we see Him? But then it gets a little scarier. Because we, when, when God tells Moses in Exodus 33, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Whoa. So there is this teaching throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament that nobody can see God. And if anybody were to see God, they would die. So what does this all mean? 
He is the image. Image or icon is not a superficial resemblance, but an exact representation. Nature, of course, reveals the existence. It reveals, it reveals the power. It reveals the wisdom of God. But it does not reveal for us the person of God. All of creation points to the fact that there is a God, but it doesn't tell us what his name is. It doesn't tell us who he is. It doesn't tell us how to have a relationship with him. Christ reveals the invisible God to us. John writes in chapter 1 of his gospel, in verse 18, he says, No one has seen God at any time. And that fits with the Old Testament and New Testament teaching. But the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So through all of this, nobody has ever seen God except for Jesus Christ. And we go, okay, what does that mean if Jesus Christ is the only one who has ever seen God the Father? So our minds start going, okay, wait a minute. No one has ever seen Jesus because if you see Jesus, you die, or you, if you saw God, you would die. But Jesus has seen God. Therefore, who is Jesus? We've got to make that mental step of going, if Jesus has seen him and he's been in the Father's bosom, what does that tell us about who Jesus is? And he says, not only that, he's declared him. Jesus is the visible expression or representation of God. But wait a minute, you say. Doesn't God dwell in unapproachable light? And we would say yes. So that means it's so bright that no one can approach Him. And that would be true. But Christ in God, in His incarnation, was able to reveal the invisible God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. You say, okay, so we take from the very beginning, and we find out that the Word, who is none other than Jesus Christ, He was there, and He was with God, and we go, okay, so they're together, and then the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. So he was in the beginning with God, and then he took up a dwelling with us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So something dramatic has changed. How is it that Christ has revealed God the Father? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, Who being in the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Christ is the one who can say, If you want to see what God really looks like, take a look at me. If you want to know what God looked like on Mount Sinai, I am God. People say, well, I... Nobody can really ever experience what it's like to be with the Father. Not so. Have a relationship with the Son, and you have a relationship with the Father. This is what Jesus was trying to get across to the disciples. Because he says to them, he who sees me sees him who sent me. And so there's a conversation that takes place with the disciples, and they're saying, and it's just, this isn't Thomas who's doubting, which you, you all know this. It's Philip. And Philip is talking with Christ and he's saying, look, we've been with you. We've seen all this great stuff. Why don't you show us the Father? Why don't you show us? He says, wait a minute. Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? Come on now. Do you really not know who I am? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? What is it you think that you are missing out on? And what is the question really begging for? Are the disciples looking for, can you show us what God the Father looks like? Because we are so curious on, is he tall or is he short? What color is his hair? How about his eyes? 
Now, we're not really looking for anything superficial like that. What we're really curious about is, and we want to know is, can we have a relationship with God the Father? Can we have fellowship with Him? Can we understand Him? Or is God the Father some force out in the universe that can't be touched, that can't sympathize with us when we cry over a lost loved one, that doesn't understand our pain when we fall, that doesn't get sin, that doesn't understand? Is God just out there ready to punish us? Is that who God the Father is? You see, (coughs) when man makes up stories about who he thinks God is, God is an almighty force that drives everything. And we are just in the wake of that force, being carried along by this impersonable thing. So what does that cause us to do and interact with one another? Might makes right is the obvious conclusion to something like that. I should just go about and do what I want to do because I don't have anybody that's going to direct my life if that story's true. We've all seen the pictures of evolution. It's laid out through high schools many times. And then all those who are leaders are shocked by the way students behave. We come from blah, and we act, we come from animals, and now we're humans, and we're supposed to behave any differently than the animal ancestors that we came from? It's just a force, an accident that happened and caused us to be who we are. If I am just an accident, what is my purpose? Why am I here? It might, there might be an accident that's, that causes me to stop existing. That's not what Christianity teaches at all. Christianity teaches you were fearfully and wonderfully made. God knew you from the time of conception. God has a purpose and a plan for you. The things that come across in your life are not accidents. But God is using things to mold you. And for believers, all things happen to us for good. Even if we can't see it for good right now. You see, He makes the invisible understandable. So, you've got that second part. He makes the invisible understandable. Hebrews, going back to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also has made the worlds. He used to go through and speak this way, but in the last days he has communicated the most effective and powerful way through Son. So we have an image. We have the full revelation of God. What more can God show us of himself than he has showed us through his Son? And that's the point that John is making. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. And still we might say, we don't really understand. We don't get it. Well, you're not alone. Remember the disciples who had spent three years with Jesus? They were on the road to Emmaus. Christ had been crucified. They had completely gotten the idea of why Christ came to begin with. They thought he was coming to establish a revolution. They thought he was going to raise up an army and overthrow the Roman dictatorship. Christ came to overthrow the rule and reign of sin in people's lives. And so they were confused. And so all of a sudden Jesus shows up and he starts walking with them on the road. And he points out that all the things in the Old Testament that refer to his birth, his death, and the resurrection of, in the Old Testament, that's all true. And he, and he points to the New Testament in which we look and we say the New Testament gives an, an account 
of this truth. I'm like, yeah, everything in the Old Testament is true. And we testify of that reality. God the Father desires to restore the relationship that was broken by his created beings when we sinned. And the cross, that's his answer. The only self-proclaimed wise people are the ones who struggle with the message of the cross. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So for the first point, shows us Christ's relationship to the Father. Christ shows the invisible act or the visible acts and the personality of God the Father. Christ connects us to the Father in a personal way. So that you and I can say and say correctly, God is my Father. I know him. And if you don't mind, I understand him as much as a finite person can understand the infinite. But God has chosen the words Father and Son to communicate that relationship. And we go, yeah, He's my Father. So that speaks and tells us something about the relationship. God is not out there going, okay, first chance I get, I'm going to get you. No, it's, come on, son. Come on, daughter. Let's go. You got this. I prepared this for you. It's going to be great. So our second point focuses on Christ's relationship to creation. We're still in the second half of verse 15. It says the firstborn over all creation. He is firstborn. Firstborn is a term that's used in our modern usage, and it speaks of oftentimes of the eldest child. So who here is firstborn? Okay, so some of you are here. You are firstborn in your family. All right. So Bible test. Firstborn does not mean the first one created or the first one that is born. Jacob and Esau. Who was firstborn? Okay, Esau was the first one that was born. But who has, who is considered the firstborn then? Ah, you said Esau, but it's not. Is it not Jacob? Well, remember, Esau's the one who came home after a hunting trip. He went out hunting, and he got nothing. Skunk, zero. He comes home, and what's Jacob doing? He's got this fine stew. I don't know what it's from Panera Bread or something, but it's a great stew. And he smells it, and he goes, I am starving. I am near death. Please give me some of your food. And Jacob goes, sure, if you sell me your birthright. Well, what's the birthright? Well, that birthright is the rights of the firstborn. And it entitled, the, the firstborn was entitled to a double portion or double rights. So the firstborn had the spiritual rights of the family, had the royal line of Abraham, and the blessings. So firstborn, when we see this, has to do with rank. It doesn't literally mean the first person who is born in the family. It has to do with the person who has the great rank in the family. Does that, does that make sense? Everyone at this time period understood firstborn referring to rank. In our modern day, we don't. We think of firstborn, we think the bully of the family, you know, or the first babysitter. That's kind of how we imagine the firstborn in the family. Um, who was the firstborn of Abraham? This one's a little trickier. Now, who was firstborn in Abraham? Okay. So, if you're saying Ishmael, he was the first one born to Isaac, but he did not have the, first, the promises and everything did not come through him, right? It was Isaac, right? Now, who was first born of Jacob? Okay, this gets really tough. Who was the first born of Jacob? Now, Someone said Joseph? Okay. Now, Jacob got a double portion. 
because his two sons got the double portion. But with Jacob, it, again, it just shows priority. Who was the first one that was born to Jacob? Or excuse me, yes, to Jacob. Reuben was his first child. Right. Now, who has the royal lineage in Jacob's family? Judah. Who has the spiritual line in his family? Who was given the line of, of, of taking care of spiritual things? Levi. Levi. So the point is, as you're seeing all these things, it's rank. First point has to do with rank, not the order of time. Let me, I'm going to pound this a little bit more. In Psalm 89, verse 20, God is saying, I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. In verse 27, I will also make him my firstborn, my highest of kings of the earth. Now remember David. What was the birth order of David? Was he the first? He's like, no. He's like number eight. He's the, he's the, he's the youngest of all of them. But he is called the firstborn of God. Speaks of rank. So, taking that idea of rank, we go to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. I will declare the decree the Lord said, said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give to you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. So here we see this played out. Though the one who was begotten, the firstborn, is one who has rank. In Psalms 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Christ is the one who has rank. It's privilege is the concept that's here. So, firstborn. He is firstborn. He is also first cause. It's worth taking your time marking in your Bible the prepositional phrases if you've never done so. For the prepositional Phrases that are here point out and focus your attention upon this little phrase. For it says here in verse 16, for I'm reading this from the New King James and I'm going to make some corrections. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Just notice that by him and through him and for him. Those prepositional phrases tell us the focus is upon all things. Not some things, not other things, but all things. So if you have a New King James, because that's what I'm preaching out of, that preposition should be read instead of by, it should be in. Because it is in him, all things. It's, a, it's speaking of a source in Christ. All things were created. In Him, all things came from Him. We might say, well, where does matter come from? Matter has always existed? No. It has a beginning. If we believe in evolution that somehow it all began with an explosion, then, and then from ex an explosion things were created... We might say, wait a minute, that sounds kind of silly that from an explosion things are created. Then we would look over what's taking place in Ukraine and think, where's all the buildings that are being built? Where's all the new things that are being made? Because there's a lot of explosions that are taking place over in a war-torn country. And we don't see anything that's ever being made from war. And men, mankind is an expert at destroying stuff. And yet... There's never been one time where we can say a bomb was blown up and all of a sudden a hospital was built. Or a car was ex exploded and all of a sudden, wow, a new toy was created. It doesn't work that way. In Christ, he is the source. Well, how? How did he do this? Well, he just spoke it. In him is the power. 
So what things are we talking about? Well, we're talking about those things that are invisible and the things that are visible. The substance and the structures that run everything. In other words, matter and whatever that visible forces that hold the matter together. We're talking about the microscopic type of stuff. We're talking about forces from physics, which we're going to, please don't go into science. I get that. But all those great things that are there, gravity, we're going to which we don't fully comprehend, but we know it's there, and it works. Christ is the agent of creation. By Him. It says, and was created, my Bible says through Him, but it's by Him, because He is the person who direct, is directly involved in the act of creation. Christ is the agent of all things. When we say by Him, it's like an author who signs the book. It says, this is by me. I did this. My hand was involved in it. Christ created the universe. This is by Him. But it goes on to more than that. Christ is the purpose of creation. It says, and for Him. For speaks of purpose. It's the reason for creation. It's not Creation wasn't made for you and I to have a playground, to run around, play around, and experiment, and try things out. It is for His good pleasure. It is for His benefit that He made all these things. And we go down to verse 17. He is the sovereign of creation. For He is before all things. There is no one beside Him. There is no rival to Jesus. He existed before all things. Creation is not part of Him, nor is He part of creation. He is outside of creation. So the rules of creation do not apply to him. He is the one who established them. He is the sovereign one. And on top of that, and in him, all things consist. He is the sustainer of creation. In him, again, the same idea is found up in verse 16. Christ is directly involved. Christ did not start or wind up the universe and then step back and just watch it run. I know there are some who believe that or think that that's exactly what must happen because it seems like creation is winding down or breaking or falling apart. God can't be involved in all these things. Are you sure? Huh. Have you read Job lately? You need to because His hand is there. He is involved. He does walk beside His saints. Christ is the cohesion that keeps the entire world together. And it is moving, moving directly on path towards His return. Are you ready to meet Him? He's coming. So in regards to Christ and the creation, we see Christ is not secondary, but He is primary to the beginning, the function, and the purpose. This, this leads us to our last point. Christ and the church. The position of Christ, there should never be any doubt in our mind that Christ, of, as to Christ's position in the church. He is the head of the church. In verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him he may have the preeminence. When we say he is the head of the church, he put all things under his feet, and he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I am not the head of the church. I'm not even the head of this local church. Christ is the head of the church. We do not seek a pastor or a pope or anyone else as the leader, the temporary leader, or a, if you want to say a steward leader on earth. I have just amount, the same amount of access to God as you do. To, is that right? That's what Scripture teaches. I don't have a special in. I can't help you skip a line and get closer to him because he lets everybody in exactly the same. He doesn't put you on hold. He doesn't make you sit in a waiting room. You call out and he responds. He is the authority of the church. When it says... Who is the beginning? The word beginning is, we get our word arc or arche. It means first cause, authority, origin. We get words like architect or archival or architect or uh, arch architecture or 
I'm not saying the word right, but you get the idea. The church started with Christ. It's important for us because the idea of the church is never found anywhere else in the Old Testament. Christ is the one who starts the church. He's also the superior, superior life is found in Christ. He says he is the firstborn of the dead. Now take that same idea. Firstborn has to do with rank and privilege. Is Christ the first person ever to be raised from the dead? No, he's not the first one to, ever, to be ever raised from the dead. Is he the first one to ever be resurrected? You're thinking through the Old Testament. Remember there was guys who were walking, and all of a sudden they stopped walking on earth, and now they're walking with God in heaven. So Christ is not the first. But he's the first with the glorified body. He is the first of, a, of his kind. He is first from the dead, and he, he is of rank and privilege. And regarding to the church, he is first of this order. So what's the purpose of Christ? That in all things he may have preeminence. Paul just summarizes this whole thing, that he may have the preeminence. What does that mean? It just means that Christ may be number one in all things. That he may be number one when it comes to the Father. That he may be number one when it comes to creation. That he may be number one in the church. So, the simple application we just have to ask ourselves, is Christ number one for me? Is Christ number one in my life? Do I put him number one? If I were to ask my spouse or my kids, is Christ number one in my life, or is he number two or number three? Does he make the top ten if they have to give the evaluation? Because they won't let you slide. And they may say, well, you talk it, but you know what? You don't really live it. And they're like, okay. Then you've got to do some work, Right? How do I make Christ number one in my life? Start by reading the Word of God. Start by reading the Word of God and then go, Lord, what I've read today, how do I apply this and work this into my life today? How do I make the things that are yours the most important thing in my life? If you make Christ number one in your life, it will not cause you to put your wife or your husband second. It will not cause you to put your children second. It will not cause you to put your employment or your hobbies or anything else second. Why is that? It's because if you are following God, it will cause all those things to rise up. But it will cause you to put sin down. It will cause you to put selfishness down. It will cause you to put pride down. And all those who are around you will think that they are number one. Because you put Christ first. That's how they will see it. So is he number one in your life? This is what the Apostle Paul is laying out before the Colossians. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the application that stands before us. We want Christ to have the preeminence in our life. We want the fullness of the Godhead working in and through us. That we might love one another like we should we might be an example before you, that you might be glorified. Whatever we're struggling with, Lord, we ask that you would help us and assist us to surrender and yield to you. Help us to get out of our own way. Help us to put aside those things that, those habits that we just seem to keep falling back into. 
We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.